a really good time and uh, had came up with a lot of great ideas in this first um, workshop session. I'm really excited to be back and moving on to the next piece of the discussion. Um, I just talked to uh, Jeff Cook and um, I know the theme of today's um, symposium is complex city, but it's also really important to remember that we're talking about global complexity and about thinking about how we're all working um, together moving forward in a sustainable way and that the perspectives of rural communities and people um, in other regions of our province and in, this, and in the Yukon are really important and really being able to sort of think about this conversation in the city context and in the complexity um, context. So with that in mind, I'm really honored to have the opportunity to introduce um, a sister duo compact magical team who are about to wow us with the changes and shaking up they've done in their communities. Um, they're a real inspiration and have done some really amazing things. Um, they are Mary and Anne Maje and they are Casca Dene women from the Yukon and will be sharing some perspectives about the challenges that they've faced and some of the changes that they've made in their community. Um, I highly recommend that you take a moment to look at um, Amory Rader's um, biography. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting with her last night and um, being inspired, as I often am in SCARP, by the work that she has done in her community. She's a very strong advocate for women's rights and a very strong advocate for the women's movement in the Casca Nation. And she is a real leader in her community and was the first democratically elected chief of the Laird First Nation. And the importance of this piece is when we actually sat down and weren't reading a bio, she actually was very instrumental in changing the process from hereditary chiefs to electoral chiefs in the community and was a real um, change maker in that perspective. And Anne, -Marie will, um, <laughs> Anne, will, Anne will share more on that with you. Her sister Mary is a Cascade Denny woman from the Ross, uh, who works for the Ross River Denny Council. Um, Mary and her husband, um, well, Mary is very committed to the land. In her capacity at the Ross River Denny Council, she works for the Yukon Environmental Section. And one of the important pieces to think about when Mary is speaking is that Mary and her husband, um, her, her husband Ted, they're still actually living off the land. They hunt. Um, Ted is known as Ted Hunts a lot. And today is spending his day in Vancouver hunting for snowshoes. <laughs> um, so without further ado, I'm really excited to um, introduce you guys to some amazing women from the Yukon who are gonna talk to us more about complexity. Good day. Um, my name is Mary Maja, and it's an honor to be here. I want to thank the Muskegon Nation for allowing us to speak on their traditional territory. Today, we're going to be um, telling you some stories about our homeland. But before we start, we want to um, <clears throat> want to open with a prayer, so could you please stand and remove your hats? Our Father, thank you for being with us today and allow us to speak in Muskium Nation, on a Muskium Nation homeland. Father, help everybody's family here, be with them, take care of them. Guide us today and we thank you for, um, <clears throat> for the food 
We thank you for the air, we thank you for the water, and most of all, the land. So we sing la. Thank you. Amen. like climbing mountains up here. Um, I'd just like to echo Mary's message of appreciation to the Musqueam people for um, allowing us to be on the beautiful homeland. I, I said yesterday when I arrived, hey, my feet's touching the ground, there's no snow. <laughs> We've got six feet of snow at home, so any avid skiers out there, you're welcome to come north. Um, so, um, we've got 45 minutes with you today, and hopefully um, you'll find that our stories we share with you will help you in the planning work that you do. Um, we admire you for, for what you're, you're doing, coming to, to learn about um, planning and how important planning is, and the many ways that we've planned in our nation to help our people. Okay. So um, I've asked Mary to talk first about our homeland, so she'll tell you a bit about who the Casca Dene are and where, where we reside and a bit about the demographics of our homeland. The Cascadena have the largest tract of land in all of North America. We as Cascadena are the caretakers of this land. As you can see, British Columbia. Um, we we have many distinct um, dialects within our traditional homeland. Although the, some dialects are different, but they have um, many similarities as well. I can speak the language and go to Fort Ware. I could speak there and somebody would answer me in my language. So, Ross River is um, way up in the um, northeast Yukon, and, um, and um, Watson Lake, where Anne is from, is um, southeast Yukon, and um, we have traditional trails to all of our to all of our communities uh, it's been there for tens of thousands of years we have um, we have many many different um, regional concepts of casca people like in Ross River alone, there's uh, five regional people that live in Ross River. That is because um, the, government, the government assimilated the people, so it, it was more convenient for them to administer um, their programs under the Indian Act. Uh, same as Watson Lake, they have maybe 10 regional groups and they all were moved or assimilated to Watson Lake. Um, Lower Post was one of the places that had um, residential school there. And I myself come in from Ross River, I was one of the groups my family lived up at Pelly Lake. It's called to this this in our language. And um, there was no roads. There was 
Only trails connect, connecting us to, um, <clears throat> to the schools in Whitehorse where I was taken as a little girl. Many of us um, <clears throat> were taken from, from our homes without um, them telling our parents that um, they were going to take us away to these schools. Some parents, they said, if you don't take your, t if you don't say yes and take my children to these schools, then um, the parents will have to go to jails and then we're going to take your kids anyway. So the parents um, had, they, because they were threatened to be put in jail, they had no choice but take the kids to um, residential school. So while I was at residential school, they told my parents and my uncles that if you don't send your kids to, if you send your kids down to these schools, and if you don't move to these community like Ross River or Watson Lake, the, the plane that flies your children back to, to Pelly Lake or to um, Pelly Banks, the plane may fall down and kill all your kids. So they didn't want that happen to their kids. So they, so they took, took, um, they traveled to these communities, even though they didn't want to. So they, that's how we were assimilated into um, living in these communities. Because in this whole territory, every inch of the Casca territory. We're a family use area. So if you went to Francis, Francis Lake, that was a family use area that belonged to somebody, where they fished, where they hunt, where they gathered medicines, gathered food, and um, followed the different seasons of um, harvesting. So many of these things were were planning they had family planning to do so in a summer summer months or in the fall the people would prepare for the onslaught of winter by making snowshoes in the fall they told us that if you made snowshoes in a springtime you call the winter so in our way, we're never allowed to make snowshoes in the springtime because the winter will come back again. So the only time you can make snowshoes is in the fall. So many of these things based on planning. And because back then, it was um, 60 below, 70 below, 80 below. You have to prepare for the seasons to come. So there was often planning involved in being a Dana. Although it was harsh, the climates were harsh, we live that good life. But although that these winters were, were, were hard, they had to make snowshoes, the men, the role of men and the role of women were different back then. But today, it's, it's a lot different. It's a lot easier for us. Not during my, my parents' day where um, we traveled by dog team in the winter and in the summer by dog pack. But it was really enjoyable because being out on the land and have that connection. But my parents' parents were more spiritual than we are today. 
when they went up on a hill, before they go up, they say prayer, offer prayer to God so that they could make it up on top of the hill. Once they got on top of the hill, they gave thanks because they were able to make it on top of that hill. They prayed when they went down the hill so they could make it down the hill. And they always prayed for good health. And that um, they, were, they offered prayers for something to eat. They live like that every day. They're very spiritual people. We are still today spiritual people. We often give thanks for our families, prayed for those that were sick. That was the only way we could live, that we offer prayer. Our spirituality is still strong today. And in saying that, I think that, um, that we're, we're doing the women today are, are um, following the old ways where we have matrilineal society. We're a matrilineal society since time immemorial. The, but today, I think it, it's a little bit contemporary because um, the paternal side of the family um, for the younger people, it, it sends mixed messages. And in planning, it's, it's really important that um, we mention maternal, the maternal line is still remains strong within our nations. So I'm just going to um, run some slides while I talk, and it'll show our people, our community people, and some of the work that we've done over the years. Um, I became involved in, uh, interested in activism and governance back in 1991. Uh, I took part in a movement and helped to spearhead to change a hereditary system of elite governance to an elected system and people asked me to run for office so I did and man that was trial by fire I had no idea what governance was <laughs> I had I, I was just a woman that was raising my children and was going to the college and I had no idea what I was getting into. And it's a good thing, because I probably wouldn't have got in <laughs> involved. It was very complex. Um, being uh, involved in, uh, as the chief of Liard First Nation, there was, there was, it was very complex. There was a lot of work to be done, but I'm not shy of hard work. So we did a lot of planning around, OK, first of all, we needed to learn about what is the role of governance like hell, what are we doing here? Because <laughs> I had a council that was naive too. But, to, but together, we forged, we forged ahead and made some really, really positive steps. And one of my platforms was healing. Because Mary talked about the residential school uh, being in our homeland. So today, we, we suffer the impacts of colonization and the assimilation she talked about. It's got, um, there's a lot of um, alcohol addictions and um, people being incarcerated, a lot of violence. So when I was sharing a story with Jeff and them, and one of the things we, we, we recognized when we took office was the, there was a lack of housing. So there was one of the mines was closing down and we thought, okay, we're gonna buy the housing that they have and move it, we moved it to our community and we, we uh, want, needed a place to move it. And there was, a, there was a plan in our office that a big consulting firm had done. And it was uh, putting a subdivision in an area. So we, had, we, we, we were clearing the area that they had designed and we were gonna put our houses there. 
and some of the elders came to us and said, you can't build houses there. And we said, why? And they said, because that's a low, low lying area and all the water will come in in the springtime. So, <laughs> hence we had to ch change our, where we, we were putting our houses. And it shows that sometimes when planning is done in isolation, you, you can run in a lot of problems, especially when consultants come and try and do a plan for you. And that's usually how the Department of Indian Affairs has done planning, like has done it for you. But today, planning in our community has become more inclusive. Uh, more community people are engaged in, in community planning. So some of the things we, we did when, when I was in office was the land claims. Um, Mary talked about our homeland. Um, we have over 97,000 square miles of unsurrendered traditional territory. We negotiated um, the land claims with the, with the Yukon government and the federal government while I was in office, but we rejected it. We rejected the claims because the reasons were the elders said um, a porcupine could walk across the land that they wanted to give us in one day. And they did not, not want to give up their Aboriginal rights to hunting and fishing. And there was other reasons, but those were the big reasons. They, weren't, they did not want to relinquish their rights. We, had, we, we did a lot of community planning, strategic planning as a community. We always felt that things were, uh, decision makers were the grassroots people. And it's grassroots people that, that helped us to build our plans. We negotiated a tripartite agreement, a policing agreement. We took down justice. We have our own Denegat justice system in our community. Um, we have a tripartite agreement with a policing agreement with the um, um, RCMP in Watson Lake. We negotiate a lot of agreements with mining companies. And then in 1998, they kicked my butt out of office. <laughs> so it took, it took about six months of sleeping because I was burnt out so bad. And I knew that, and I, was, I had a lot of wounds that I had to heal. So I went into myself for a while and um, started looking at myself and taking care of myself. And then it came, and, and then I, I, in having dialogues and visiting with my, some of my sisters, we started talking about what we could do to address the social problems in our community. So that's how we formed the Liard Aboriginal Women's Society. And in 2000, we received funding from the Aboriginal Healing Foundation to uh, um, implement a comprehensive healing program designed by us in our community to address the social problems. And we designed it so that all of our programs are rooted in culture. We believe that culture is the way through to healing the problems that affect our community. We, we, we built a camp at Francis Lake, which is part of our homeland. And where you see the, the, the moose hide, that's the camp we have. And it's two hours outside of Watson Lake. And we have 13 little tent frames there. We often struggle with funding. Uh, our little organization um, has an office staff of two people. Uh, and we have six wonderful, devoted board members. We have board members, our Mary Maje is a board member. Fanny Vance, who lives in Lower Post, is a board member. Uh, Dorothy Smith, who lives in Ross River, is a board. Mary Charlie lives in Watson Lake. Eliz Porter lives in Watson Lake. And May Broadhagen lives in Watson Lake. So with the board, we sought out to address the healing issues of our community and started to also address violence. Because violence in the North is at an epidemic level. 
And um, with the camp, we take people to camp all summer. And they learned how to identify medicines, traditional medicines. We'd gather medicines. We, like you see moose, um, the meat there, we cut it up. What we do in the summer is we preserve it. We, we cut it up very thinly, it's an art. And I'm not very good at it, by the way. <laughs> um, I always say I'm not the most brilliant in our culture, but I know who to be with, and my sister is here. <laughs> so it's a real art to cut this meat really thin, and we hang it, and we smoke it, and, and it's dried. And then you preserve it forever, basically. Um, so the camp provided a sense of belonging which the Lower Post Residential School separated, created a separation. So the camp brought us back to our values. People out in camp would take care of each other. We'd share, we'd uh, teach each other how to sew, do our medicines like the elder here. She's one of our great teachers in our community, Maida Donacy. She's still with us. She does a lot, of, she is in her 80s, late 80s, and she's teaching at the elementary school. She's never missed a day of work. She goes there for the last 15 years, every day teaching the, ch the children in the school. And she, she has more energy than a lot of us. <laughs> she goes home every day and she's doing her hides and hunting, and she traps. <laughs> so, um, with the comprehensive healing program, there was many different components we had. We did traditional psychotherapy and Western psychotherapy. We brought in Dr. Alan Wade and Dr. Catherine Richardson, who are from the response-based uh, center in Victoria. They do a lot of groundbreaking work, work on looking at the, um, using response-based approach to address violence and understanding violence. In 2003, we, um, the women came together and were at our camp and all complaining about the governance and how governance was just not working on Casca homeland. And nowhere where it was anybody listening to our voices. Nobody was listening to us. And we wanted our voices heard. So we developed a proposal called Hearing Our Voices. And the, the, the project Hearing Your Voices was to engage Casca women in the development of the Casca National Constitution. So with Casca leadership from all five communities, we started to work to build our Casca National Constitution. And as a result of that, of that project, the Casca National Constitution is, now has a draft constitution with all of its many acts of governance, a finance act, good administration act, all of the, the acts attached to it. It's on our website, by the way. One of the things we find with our organization, because we don't get core funding, a lot of the programs, pro projects we do aren't sustained. So with the, with the CASCA National Constitution, it couldn't get ratified because of funding. We didn't have the next leg of funding for ratification. So it sits in draft. Part of the um, Hearing Our Voices project, um, which what we found about it was that we had to educate grassroots people about what is the Constitution. Many of us in this room take a constitution for granted. We know what it's for, what it does. Many of our grassroots people didn't know why we needed a constitution. In 2009, I think it was about 2009, uh, Mary Maggi and Ted introduced me to Jeff Cook. <laughs> and I must say the university is very fortunate to have Jeff work with, with in your, in your facil facility here. He's, he's helped us in many, many ways. I met Jeff over a cup of coffee, and he said, I'd like to help you. 
I'd like to help the women, he said. I like the work that you guys are doing. And if there's some way I can help, um, I'd like to be a part of that. And he, sh I mean, he should never have said that. Because <laughs> right away, uh, I jumped on it and I said, oh yeah, you can help us. We, want, we need a treatment plan here. We need something, we need a culturally relevant treatment program on our land. And so he says, okay, Anne, let's, I'll help you. So together, we did the proposal. We submitted it to crime prevention. No, it was, was turned down. So we, not taking no for an answer, we submitted it to Northern Strategy. Um, Northern Strategy Trust Fund was, is a, was a trust fund in the Yukon with federal dollars that went to the Yukon uh, the criteria was it for that fund is that only government could apply for the funding. So I had to do some lobbying. So I lobbied Liard First Nation, our First Nations, to partner with us to develop the treatment strategy. So in 2008, we received funding to develop the, uh, our 10-year treatment strategy. It's very comprehensive. Um, there was a lot of work. Uh, we, we, we organized a committee of, of stakeholders that came together that would guide the process. We uh, had newsletters, publicly always on the radio, inviting people to come in, um, and had a lot of, um, Jeff has a way of keeping people engaged in a planning process, keeping them interested in it by, we like prizes, a lot of prizes, lots of fun, lots of laughter, lots of stories. Um, so he always made that planning process where we had always a huge turnout of people coming and being involved. And people felt hopeful that there was going to be a way to help us address the addictions in our community. But because of different political um, situations and funding, uh, our plan didn't get funded. It's complete, but we don't have the funding to implement the plan. And all we're looking for is a position. We've, we've lobbied government, we've lobbied mining companies, and we cannot get any funding to, for, to hire an implementation coordinator. A couple of implementation coordinators would be great. Uh, if anybody in the room is interested in helping us, <laughs> we've, our website, just look us up. We'd be so grateful. I mean, it's because of outside help and others that have helped us that we've done so much. But I must say in planning, what I've learned in First Nations community is always be respectful, treat people with dignity and respect, um, have a plan A, but more important, have plan B. Uh, don't, don't come with your suits. <laughs> <laughs> Leave your suits at home. Um, be prepared to make last minute changes, for sure. Always, always the environment is, is changing. It's very complex. Don't be afraid. First Nations people are very welcoming and very opening, very, very open to new people. Um, So uh, just along with it, in March 31st, 2010, our project from, with funding from the Aboriginal Healing Foundation got cut off. So I got laid off um, and um, of course, never wanting to be bored for a moment, <laughs> I started uh, lobbying Health Canada for funding to continue with our work. And at the same time, while I was off, um, worked on a proposal to Status of Women Canada. 
And 2010 was an interesting year in the Yukon. Um, things happened with the RCMP um, that questioned the integrity of the RCMP in the Yukon. Um, a couple incidents happened that would uh, be the catalyst for how policing is done in the Yukon. Um, in 2010, Raymond Silver Fox died uh, in a jail cell in Whitehorse. There was racial slurs as he laid in his cell. While he had soiled his pants, the RCMP did not bother to take him to the hospital. So he died in the cell. In the same year, a couple of members, RCMP members in Watson Lake community, were accused of raping a young woman. So it left in question how we were being policed and people in the Yukon were very, very upset. And so the North called for a public policing review. So the Minister of Justice, um, Minister Horn at that time, called for a police review. And the Yukon communities cried and, and spoke about the need for policing to change and policing brutality to change. And policing needs to, need, need to be more responsive when there are calls made to them in terms of calls for violence against women because women were crying that the call, they weren't coming fast enough. And in community, they felt that there was racism and um, prejudice in terms of who they served. So while was this was going on, we developed a proposal to status of women. We lobbied other women's organizations and um, developed the proposal together for justice on language, violence, and responsibility. And in partnership with the RCMP, together with the women's organizations, RCMP, we um, embarked on a two-year um, process of workshops and understanding language and how language conceals violence. And together we learned about how victims respond to violence. And we learned that victims will always respond if you, are at, if you ask them how, to re, how did they respond. Most people get there, how did they react? We talked about, in our workshops, we talked about the many ways in which victims resist violence. And how, I guess sometimes there's a, a notion out there that First Nations children that went to the residential school did not resist. But there was a lot of resistance in the school. And I'll tell you one story of resistance. A little boy left his home. His mother tied his moccasins. He went to the lower post school. He would not let anybody untie his, shoe, his laces on his moccasins because his mother tied them. That was his way of resisting. We learned how language conceals violence and how mutualizing language is used when we speak of violence and how it's a, a relationship problem when the man is violent and how women are blamed when there's violence against a woman, how women it says that when a young woman is raped, how many ask, well, why did you dress that way? Why is it her fault? We say women attract that type. When a, Alan says alcohol is a weaponry of violence. If people know that 
alcohol is making you violent, you choose. You choose to drink. You made that choice. You should not drink if you know alcohol makes you violent. Oftentimes, uh, we've learned through those workshops how partners conceal the bruises, right? Won't hit on the face, it's conscious, they, they hit on the body. So together with the RCMP, we sat in these workshops. At first, there was lots of resistance from the RCMP. They, um, they sat right across the other room, arms crossed. <laughs> but because they thought, I think they thought we were going to be critical and judgmental of them, but we didn't. We killed them with kindness. <laughs> we offered a lot of prizes. We offered them good food, lots of good stories, and um, we celebrated. Uh, in March 8th, 2013, we celebrated the signing of uh, community police pro safety protocol with the RCMP and Watson Lake. <laughs> Thank you. That protocol to us is really important. Before, the, before that protocol, when the RCMP came, uh, we had new members come in. They said they felt so unwelcome. People were so cold towards them. But it was through our relationship building with the community, through our little process, it, it helped. It helped to now the RCMP in our community have a rapport with the community. They have a partner in us. They have a partner in us to, to address violence against women. We have a new sergeant there who is very, very keen on working with the community to address violence. We have a commanding officer. This project was very successful because I need to give a shout out for the commanding officer of the Yukon Territory, Peter Clark. He was the one that attended all the workshops in Watson Lake and in Whitehorse because that's how important he felt it was. So he led the way. So we received limited funding from the, um, that's the signing. <laughs> We received limited funding from the Yukon government uh, women's directorate and we hired a part-time uh, Together for Justice implementation coordinator. And who we hired was our past tribal chief <laughs> who has a good rapport with people and knows how to bring people together. So he's been busy while I've been away um, trying to do the second leg of implementing that agreement. So, um, in closing, I just want to say um, we work in a very complex environment. Um, the reasons, one of the reasons why I think we're successful is that we're a separate entity. Uh, Liard Aboriginal Women is not attached to the, the band, the First Nation. We receive all our funding separately from government through proposals. Because in our community, and you, if in community planning, you will learn that community, First Nations community, very political. And my advice is don't become involved in it. <laughs> it can get very messy. And you're hearing it from somebody who's been involved in it for 30 years. <laughs> yes. Um, we're very friendly people. We love to share. I invite you all to come up, look us up in the Yukon, and i just like to thank you for giving us the opportunity and your generous time and your kind hospitality here. Sugasanla.
All right. So now I stand between you and lunch, and <laughs> we're running really late. So I'm going to make this really short. I just heard an amazing story of some wicked problems and some really elegant approaches to that in terms of building relationships and working through culture. Um, so thank you again for those stories. And yeah, we're going to we're going to skip the questions and go straight into lunch. But we invite you to to share questions during lunch. Um, just as the timekeeping, it's right now 12.30, and the next panels start at 1.30. I, I ran up here without my sheet, but I'm pretty sure 1.30. We're going to give you a 10-minute and a 5-minute warning before uh, you need to head to the panels. So go ahead and have lunch now. Thank you.